discussing hemodynamic assessment and fluid management um, is a major challenge. Um, it's, a, it's a large area to talk about. So I want to basically use four straightforward questions to, to talk about this. Uh, the first one I seems rather straightforward, seems rather easy. So which hemodynamic uh, parameters do we need to monitor? Um, so the cardiovascular system is actually very complex, and we know that from our daily business in theatre. Uh, watching our patients, uh, different pathologies, interacting what we do uh, every day. So looking at the cardiovascular system, uh, we're looking at the Starling curve, we're looking at the venous return curve, uh, and both are interacting. On top of that, we're looking at a pulmonary and a general uh, circulation uh, to make it even more complex. Uh, and the heart, of course, uh, four different chambers, four different areas where pressure is different. Um, and of course, we have the interaction of the cardiovascular system with the lungs. Uh, then again, in theater, we also use positional changes, also offsetting uh, all these systems, altering the interactions uh, and making it more complex. And ultimately, uh, of course, the heart is connected uh, from the right to the left side and back again with, uh, with arteri arteries and, and veins. Um, and they are also changing all the time with the drugs we use. They vary between patients based on their comorbidities. Um, so all in all, a very complex system. So how do we go about? So I suggest that we actually look at the actions we have in our arsenal. Um, we want to assess whether the patient is normal volemic or whether we need to add fluid. Are they hypo or hypervolemic even? Do we need to give diuretics? Or are they phasoplegic? Do we need to give a constrictor? And in the end, of course, we need to assess whether we need to support the heart and increase the contractility. These are the basic questions we are confronted with every day. Um, and there are a lot of tools out there that can support us doing this. Um, so again, we can look at about everything and we can make it as complicated as we want, adding ultrasound to this uh, and to the other measurements we already have. So going through the list of, of things we have available, uh, let's start off with the things we measure every day. Static filling pressures, central venous pressure, mean arterial pressure, they actually show no correlation whatsoever um, to the uh, Starling curve. Um, so can we use them as trend? Uh, can we monitor them and see whether the patient is moving in one way or another? Actually, another thing that we, uh, we don't know. Looking at dynamic parameters, they've got a lot of attention over the last decade. Um, uh, PPV and SVV, pulse pressure variation, stroke value, uh, volume variation. Um, that's looking at the interaction of the lungs with the cardiovascular system. Um, and they have some limitations as well. They look promising, but we don't use them in uh, spontaneous uh, breathing patients. And of course, tidal volume needs to be sufficient to actually assess them. And again, other situations that occur in theater quite often, like abdominal pressures during lapar laparoscopy or open chest conditions, they all uh, influence the quality and the accuracy of these parameters. So can we use challenges, uh, a, a passive lack raising challenge or a PEEP challenge? It all very much uh, is based on whether we can do that actually in theater. Is it allowed by the surgeon to do it? So again, more difficulty, um, more complexity uh, in our face. Uh, so looking at uh, cardiac output monitoring um, and fluid loading responsiveness. So fluid loading responsiveness is basically assessing whether uh, we can give more preload, give fluid, and uh, it will actually benefit your patient. Uh, so predicting that response by the patient, uh, ultimately to decrease the number or the amount of fluid we're giving rather, um, we look at cardiac output with this receiver operating curve. We can actually see it's a rather a mi mixed bag. Uh, and although it looks promising, it's in the upper quartile, sensitivity is high, specificity is high, it's still not where we want it to be. So just looking at fluids, can we use baseline measurement of cardiac output? Absolute values are not that reliable. So again, looking at a more dynamic approach, uh, can we use uh, a fluid challenge? And I guess most people will do that every day. Um, 
can we use a fluid challenge and look at changes in the cardiovascular system uh, to see whether we uh, need to fluid load our patient. So we looked into that um, with a couple of patients, 21 to be exact, after cabbage uh, or valve surgery. And we found that if you give a 200 ml fluid bolus, you can actually identify the responder from the uh, non-responder. Um, so uh, it actually is very accurate at predicting whether you need to give more fluid, give the rest of the bag, uh, and uh, supplement the f to 500 mils. So this looks rather promising. Another thing we can do is one of those challenges is the passive leg raising. You raise the legs by 30 or 45 degrees, and you basically give an autotransfusion. It's reversible, so that's very charming. And like you see, the delta cardiac output is rather predictive of fluid loading responsiveness. So this is a tool that we want to use. Although, I guess, if we use it in theater, some surgeons will start complaining. And I guess uh, this is more valuable to the ICU physician than it will be to the anesthetist. So looking more in depth into this fluid loading responsiveness uh, concept, uh, there are, this meta-analysis summarizes uh, these findings. If you lump all of the literature together, we find that pulse pressure variation, given the limitations of the ventilator settings, spontaneous breathing, etc., is rather reliable in predicting fluid loading responsiveness. And passive leg raising has actually more uh, accuracy uh, to give us. So it is a valuable tool, but again, more uh, an ICU tool than a theater tool. So trying to boil it down to the bare essentials, um, if you ask me to what, what would you want to watch in theater, what would you uh, try to assess, it's looking at preload. Do I need to give fluids or not, or diuretics for that matter? Um, so how is contractility and do I need to give inotropes for that? And you want to look at afterload. So these are the three um, uh, concepts you really want to look at, the three items you really want to assess. And there are a couple of tools that you can use. But ultimately, it's all about delivering oxygen to the tissues. And uh, Shoemaker, a while back, showed us quite uh, clearly that if we want to make a difference in the operating room, uh, it's about identifying the patient that is developing a deficit and turning it around. He found that if people develop a oxygen deficit um, and you don't reverse it in time, they're actually prone to get uh, complications or they even die uh, in hospital. So it's all about delivering oxygen to the tissue. And if you look at the formula, we've all learned uh, a while back in medical school, at least for me that is, um, you have to look at uh, the amount of erythrocytes that are circulating and keep HB at a certain level, give enough oxygen, but ultimately it's all about delivering um, the oxygen, so flow. So for this question, uh, what parameters do I need to look at to assess hemodynamic? Uh, hemodynamics. It's basically that it is very complex to assess hemodynamics and that every technique and every parameter for that, for that uh, matter is actually something that has contraindications and indications. Uh, that, makes it, that, may, that adds to the complexity of intervening and assessing. So assess preload, afterload and contractility to ultimately optimize organ perfusion. I think that's the bottom line here. So let's go on and talk about fluid management and morbidity. Um, the effect of hyperphilemia, as we all know, is that we increase the chances of death. We, increases, we basically increase all kinds of nasty things occurring after surgery. And again, I have to stress here, there is a time um, interval between our interventions and the complications occurring. But hypervolemia in theater will lead to some nasty things happening uh, after the patient leaves. ICU length of stay can be increased and hospital stay can be increased as well. So now referring to a, a trial that's been performed uh, by uh, Judy Thacker and Monty Mython uh, that clearly shows this relationship where you want to achieve hypo or basically achieve normal volemia and want to avoid uh, hypo or hypervolemia. So in tens of thousands of colonic surgery patients, they looked at three categories. 
for this the same type of surgery, patients either get uh, between 0 and 1.5 liters of fluid balance, and correct me if I'm wrong, Monty, uh, between 1.5 or 3, or 3 and up. And you could see that there is a clear correlation between the fluid balance in theater and the chance of staying longer in hospital um, and all kinds of other complications. I just took ileus here, but there are a couple of other complications that have the same relationship. Um, and this U-shape is actually a confirmation of something that was posted or formulated earlier, that we're looking for this optimum. We're looking for an optimum uh, in every patient. Normal volemia, we, that's something we need to achieve. If you go give to little flu fluids, you will get a lot of complications. And even more so if you go more liberal and achieve hypervolemia in your patient. And complicating this is that every patient is different, which means that um, uh, that this normal volemia, this optimal point, is probably different for every patient. So again, referring to this uh, Lilo paper, uh, uh, something that was carried out in the, in the US and California, uh, you could see that uh, for different types of surgery, looking at the amount of fluid that was given for this exact same type of patient uh, by different care providers on different days, there is a lot of standard deviation. There's a lot of variance between practices even within the same care provider. So one day you could give uh, a zero fluid balance uh, or achieve that and later on you'd, the next case you would give a lot more. And it's this variance that um, for me basically shows that and this graph shows it even more, that there's a lot of variance going on, that there is a lot to gain. So um, I think variance is a signal that uh, we can optimize more. So over time, in the last decades, we've seen a move from liberal fl uh, fluid management in the 1980s to more restrictive fluid regimens uh, thereafter. Uh, to an, a time where we were assessing fluid responsiveness, and I think the 250 or more papers that are out there are evidence of that. And then we moved on to gold record therapy with more than 50 trials uh, and a large number of meta-analyses out there at the moment. So gold record therapy um, is uh, a way of achieving certain goals, most, mostly um, uh, cardiac output-based targets are, are in place and fluid is optimized, or cardiac output rather, is optimized with the use of fluids and sometimes inotropes. And Pierce uh, rather, showed rather well that gold record therapy in itself uh, and having a protocol like that uh, is very good at achieving uh, a higher oxygen delivery. I also re already referred to the meta-analyses that were or are available out there. Uh, the one by Pierce um, is probably stuck to mind most people. Uh, and it showed that uh, if you stack all these trials together, um, there is a big impact if we look at um, a target, predominantly uh, cardiac output, and optimize it in achieving less complications in our uh, high-risk surgical cases. Now, some will say that um, enhanced recovery after surgery uh, in itself um, is what makes a difference, and it's not fluid therapy on its own. Uh, well, you see here that without the ERAS uh, context, you can see that uh, fluid uh, or gold record fluid therapy uh, achieves at uh, reducing complications. And although less significant, uh, it still adds to the outcome and within ERAS if you uh, discern it from, from that setting. So for me, um, GDFT or GDT rather is a integrate part of the ERAS approach to the enhanced recovery after surgery approach. Um, GDFT allows us to um, reduce the number of uh, or the, the size of the variability that we see out there. Um, and there's a high impact for our high-risk surgical cases. And I just want to touch upon an issue that I think uh, doesn't receive enough attention, and that is the amount of fluid our patients are getting in the ward. Uh, if you look at these trials, none of them actually discuss what the standard is for their post-surgical care in the ward, which I think in itself is a, an interesting finding. And actually, for our own institution, I don't know what we're doing in the ward. But I, I think looking at variability in, in theatre, it can be random chaos out there as well. 
So moving on to the third question, what are the high-risk patients? Assuming that I want to institute uh, cold record therapy for my patients, who do I target uh, and how do we assess this risk? Now this is, again, uh, a question that, that varies uh, and, and is based on the setting. So if we look at this trial by peers that assessed uh, mort in hospital mortality, we can see that there are some, uh, a couple of, of, uh, of indicators of risk. Um, emergency surgery, of course, very high risk uh, surgery. Abdominal surgery in general, um, there is higher mortality for that group. Um, and the list goes on and on, and I think we basically know what they, what they are, uh, which operations provide the major risks for postoperative mortality and morbidity. So then looking at it in more detail, um, and I think Boyd uh, quite eloquently uh, stated that uh, high risk also depends on your own setting, um, the cost of, uh, adva of advanced monitoring uh, and, and implementing it. Uh, there's a trade-off and you need to, to uh, for every hospital it's basically different. Uh, and it also depends on the complexity of your own case mix. But in the end, it's duration of surgery, uh, potential blood loss, um, the approach, so open or laparoscopy, uh, location of surgery. Um, most of the times if you open a uh, body cavity, there's a higher risk involved. Um, and uh, of course, your own local practice is uh, important too. So moving on to risk scores. Are there any risk source that I can use to assess these risks and, uh, and basically have an easy tool to assess who, I do, who do I need to target? Now looking at all of these scores, and this is just a limited number that I displayed here, um, is that um, there are a lot out there and most of them look at one, two or three components. Um, but ultimately, not all of them do rather well. Uh, or most of them actually um, don't assess risk to the point that we want. ASA score, I think everyone knows and sees it every day that it's not a proper assessment of risk uh, and stratification of risk uh, for the uh, postoperative setting. So I want to look at this last, um, last risk score that I mentioned, the POSPOM. Uh, some, it was uh, published um, rather recently. Um, and the POSPOM uh, is basically a big data approach to um, acquiring a, a good risk score. Um, and the objective was to assess risk from only preoperative uh, information, uh, basically what we do in everyday practice. So what did they do? They targeted adult patients undergoing surgery under anesthesia, any form. Um, they built the score with the use of more than 2 million uh, cases in France and they validated again on a similar group. So it's building the score and validation in one. Um, and they looked at three components, age, comorbidities uh, and the type of surgery in itself. Now, first results were really, really good. Um, and as you see here, um, so this is basically shows you uh, the strat stratification. So the line is the risk and the, the scores are displayed with the bars. And actually, as you see, risk rather goes up really well and it, it corresponds really good with the, with the, with the scores. Um, so we have an, potentially a very good score here. So if you look at what it ultimately come up with, uh, they have 17 age groups, age brackets that they use uh, to stratify risk. Uh, and then they look at patient comorbidities. 15 comorbidities listed here, all with their own added risk profile. Um, and then they, they displayed 25, I think it was, um, uh, types of surgery. Now, of course, this list uh, for some surgeries is less practical. So if you do uh, use of ejectomies, um, you actually are in the body, in, in both in the abdomen and in the, in the thorax fiddling around. So that means uh, you probably risk is higher than you can, can actually assess here. Um, so my take home message here is high risk is a trade off between the patient, both age and comorbidities, uh, and the type of surgery that they're gonna perform. 
uh, monitoring uh, level that you want to institute and basically adapt to this risk uh, is a trade-off between that risk, your local practice, and your financial setup. Um, again, a limitation, I think, that the last bit. Um, scores can help uh, to assess that risk, um, but good scores are rare. And POSPOM uh, gives us a, a good uh, possibility there. Although I think we're not quite there yet because physiology, um, uh, acute problems are not in there.